Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. Today I'm going to speak to the Worker Bride and um, I really pray that it will be a blessing unto you and an encouragement, but also that you will uh, allow the Spirit to show you things that you need to deal with, you know, while there is still time. So Father has in the past few weeks um, been speaking to me about His Eminency that He will take out um, the bride and um, that the workers will be going out. Also, you can see um, by the content of my devotional teachings, very focused on the, the eminency of the spirit that will be poured out and um, just what the harvest workers will be um, exposed to and just preparing them. And that's my call, you know, to prepare the harvest workers. So um, this devotional teaching focuses um, a, a lot on the disposition of the bride and the responsibility of the worker bride, so to speak. So once again, you know, as Father always speaks to me through dreams and visions or numbers or whatever the case may be, um, this is no exception. So um, before we start, let's just first pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege that I have to speak to your children to your work of bride, Father. I thank you, Father, that, that you brought this message to me to relay to your children. And it's up to them, Father, what they do with it. I cannot take responsibility for what they hear um, and what they do with it, Father. But I do know, Father, that you are laying great emphasis on your eminency of coming to take out your bride and that we truly need to be ready we truly so many of us have heard so many times over and over he's coming soon he's coming soon um, that we almost don't hear it anymore but the bride will be watching and praying so father i thank you that you are preparing our hearts even in these last few minutes or seconds you are preparing our hearts to stand before the Son of Man. And I just thank you for that. I pray that we may be earnest about what you are speaking to us in this devotional teaching. That your anointing rest upon me to relay what is on your heart. And I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, so not long ago, um, the fourth and or the 5th, I'm not sure, of June, I was in my kitchen and um, the spirit came over me and I went into the scullery and I started to cry. And what happened was that I started crying out to him, longing to see his face. I said to him, this feels like a long distance relationship where you read each other's letters, but you never see each other. Um, and that I long to see his face. I want to see, I want to look into his eyes. I want to behold him, as the word says. And I say to him, I want to see your countenance. I want to stand before you. I want to be able to touch you. And I was just crying, longing for him. And what made this interesting was that it was the spirit that came over me. I wasn't in my kitchen thinking about, oh, I wonder when he's coming. Um, no. It, the spirit came over me and the spirit in me started crying out for him. And I, the words that came out of my mouth was, when are you coming? When will I see you? When are you coming? Dates have come and gone. When will it be enough? When will I see you? And I didn't expect him to answer me. And... We should stay away from people that tell you the Lord told me he's coming on this and this day. It's not going to happen. Okay. I didn't expect him to answer me. It was rhetorical. It was a cry from my heart. And about, uh, I can't remember whether it was the next morning or the day after, I woke up with the following words. My morning doves will take flight in the morning. I was like, Wow, he actually answered me. No idea what it means, but he answered me. <laughs> so my morning doves take flight in the morning. And so 
Obviously, when I hear the words dove, I think of the Song of Solomon, where he often speaks to his bride or uh, that she is a dove. And you will remember that in Luke 11, he, his disciples ask him for what are the signs that will happen in the time to come, the tribulation. So Luke 11 has to be read prophetically. And he tells them that he, he will be here as a greater Solomon. So when he says that he will be here as a greater Solomon, he is referring to two things. First thing, that he is the bridegroom. The second, that he is the builder. So he's the bridegroom builder. And that is exactly what the bride is. She is the bride builder. Okay, so they will be working together. So he says a greater than Solomon is here. So referring, going back to the dove, um, about seven years ago uh, or so ago, I um, went into my garden and I found a baby dove, new newborn baby dove, and didn't have any wings yet. You can still see the veins in the little body. The eyes are still closed, completely and utterly dependent on its mother. And as I picked it up, I knew that it was as good as dead. And I threw it over the wall because I didn't want my dog or the cats to get to it and bring it into the house. And as I was looking at this dove, coming so sad when I looked at it, this little pathetic little thing in my hands, the spirit said to me, this is what I'm bringing you into as good as dead. It's quite a message to receive. And this is also what he then since then did in me. And in my last devotional teaching, where I, uh, the counting the cost, it's basically what it boils down to, bringing you into such a place of dependence and death that unless he is the life in you, you do not have any life within you. And this is what he brings the bride into. So let's go back to the uh, Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. And we're going to read from chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter 2. Such a beautiful love letter. Okay. Verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Okay. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. So we've got sons and daughters here. I sat down under the shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. That's one of the things I said to him when I was crying out to him. I said to him, I am sick of love. I am so, so desperate to be with him. Not away from this earth, not away from all the things of this earth. That's, that's not even in my consideration because I'm going to be here to work. What I was crying out for was to be with him, to see his face. Okay, I was sick with love. His left hand, verse 6, his left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up, nor awake my love till he please. The voice of my beloved, she hears his voice. Remember, in the last few teachings, um, I've got one teaching, it's called When He Speaks, When God Speaks. She knows his voice. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Okay, so he is speaking to her. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. 
The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Such beautiful writing. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Then she speaks to him. She says to him, O oh, my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Exactly what I said. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the the vines for our vines have tender grapes so here she in the previous one in verse 13 she speaks about the fig tree putteth forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes she's talking about the young ones their young ones their harvest is young and she then says let's get rid of these foxes that are in the vines in our harvest let's get rid of them and then verse 16 my beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. The lilies, they are the, the, the children. The, uh, in the devotional teaching that I did called the Queen of the South, I talk about the lilies and that the bride has the lilies, the virgins that follow her. Okay, so he is, um, they are among the children. The virgins. Verse 17. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethair. So remember, he said to me, My morning doves take flight in the morning. And so when he says in verse 17, Until the day break and the shadows flee away, Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe, or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethur. He's talking about the morning. So he's telling her to come away with her. And she is saying, until the daybreak, he must come to her. So let's dissect this a little bit. So in verse, let me see what verse that is. He tells her that the, the winter is past. Okay, and um, that the flowers are coming out. Verse 12. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of the birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. So the flowers appear means it's springtime. And what happens in springtime? New life. New life is coming, right? And he says it's time for the singing of the birds. And we know what spring sounds like. Um, but this singing of the birds is also a reference to um, to worship. It's a reference to a time of of singing, of joyful singing of this new thing that is coming. Okay, and then he says, and the voice of the turtle is in our heard in our land. Now the turtle is a turtle dove not an actual turtle it's a turtle dove if you go into the strong's meaning and it means a morning dove so when he said to me the my morning doves take flight in the morning he was talking about the turtle dove and it says they sound like morning because they are mourning for him to return they truly mourning and crying out for him to return and a lot of people are so used to hearing of his return that they are actually not even looking for him. They are busy with those very things. They are busy with eschatological studies. They are busy with trying to understand all these things. But there's not actually a true mourning in them for it. They are not truly mourning and crying out for him to return. They are busy with the things of it, but not with him necessarily. Okay, so there, there has to be a cry. And so this turtle dove is crying. She's mourning for his return, truly mourning for his return. Okay. Then he 
then in verse 14, it says, O my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. So she's talking to him. Now that dove in the Strong's Concordance, it means a rock dove. So it's different to the turtle dove. Here it is him. She is telling him, you are my rock. and You are the rock that has been cleft for me. And you are there in that secret place. And here I want to hear your voice. I want to come into that secret place with you and hear your voice. So they are lovebirds, right? The dove morning dove and the rock dove, completely in love, in love with each other, okay, so this daybreak means morning, and the word day means a day, a time, or a year, and it says until the shadows flee away, and that is a reference to a sundial, when you go into the Strong's Concordance with that shadows, it means when the sun is at its highest peak, right and you no longer see shadows that means noon so he breaks forth in the morning he comes and he breaks forth until there is no more shadows and she's saying come as a row as a heart come and break through the darkness come and come over the hills and the mountains now the hills and the mountains yeah. speaks of tribulation Come and leap over those mountains, those difficult things, and come to us. Come and get me. Okay. So, she says, over the mountain of Bethur. Now, this Bethur means cleft, and it means a sacrifice that is cut into two. So, immediately we have an understanding that this is talking about covenant. This is talking about covenant. She is in covenant with him during this time that she has been prepared where she this worker bride this bride has been prepared for the rock dove this turtle dove has been prepared in difficulty in the hills and the valleys she's been prepared she's crying out she has been cut she has placed herself on as, on, as a sacrifice on the altar Romans 12 and he, as the high priest, has dealt with every area in her life. She has entered into covenant with him. She identifies with his death by allowing him to bring her to a place of being as good as dead. She is that dove that has entered into covenant with him. Okay. So the word... Uh, the Bethere, that mountain, which means cleft, made me think of Yeshua on the cross when he was in his side, he was pierced, the rock was cleft, and what flowed out of that side of him was water and blood, and what flows out of a woman when she gives birth is water and blood. So this piercing, this cleft from which the bride will come out speaks of that birth that will take place when the escape or the rapture, as many people understand it, but it's actually the escape. When that will happen, that will bring a birth of the things spoken in Acts 2, where signs and wonders will take place and the great harvest will come in. But that will be only for a short while. Okay. So he is, she refers to him as a roe, and a roe means beauty, glory, and honor. So she says, come in your majesty, come in your, 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 uh, your glory, as, as beautiful as you are, you know, come forth. Think of Solomon, the king. And a heart means a ram, a sacrifice, mighty, splendor, glory, chief, a pillar, and a strong man. Now, in my Queen of the South uh, teaching, I talk about how he is the pillar and how the queen is standing next to him as a pillar and that the word queen or right, uh, uh, standing on his right hand, means south. 
So she's the queen of the south, the bride rising up with him. She's the queen of the south and she is also a pillar standing next to him. She's been made into a pillar. And here she is crying out to him, this turtle dove, to the rock dove, saying, come as a pillar. Come in your stately, kingly stature as the bride or the bridegroom builder, as, as Solomon. Come, come and, and, and come and get me. Come over the hills and come and find me. Okay. And in my um, disciples, my disciples teaching that I did recently, I also spoke about how the bride is also seen as a deer. Because in Psalm 45 it says that as the deer panteth for water, so my soul thirsteth after thee. That longing. And in Habakkuk 2 it talks about that he will make our feet as hinds feet. So she's also a deer or a dove. And the enemy is hunting the deer. is hunting the dove. He's after the bride. And he's after the bridegroom. Okay. So the other day I woke up 20 minutes, 21 minutes past three, and that's 23, 21 in the Strong's, and it means friend of God. And the word friend of God, once again, a friend is a covenant term. So the words loving kindness and friend, and there's other words as well, all refer to being in covenant. And if you go back to David and Jonathan, Jonathan apparently was also from the tribe of Benjamin, um, that reference, the covenant that ma they made, was that the word says that their soul was knitted into one. Very important this that you understand. Their soul was knitted into one. They and, and, and David took off his armor, he took off his coat, his shoes, everything and his sword, and he gave it to Jonathan. And in the same way, Christ comes with us and he says, I am in covenant with you through the cross. I have been slaughtered like the animals were slaughtered before Abram. And I stand in covenant with you, my bride. I stand in covenant with you and you with me. Whatever is mine is yours. Whatever is yours is mine. And the other day I was thinking of um, just exactly what is mentioned here in Song of Solomon 2, where it says, my beloved is mine and I am his. And I was thinking of those words and I think, I was thinking, how can, you know, are we truly thinking about those words? Is it really true that you are his? Especially when you think in covenantal terms, is everything his? Whether it's your husband, your wife, your child, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your possessions, your dreams, your ministry. Can he take anything from you when he wants, how he wants, should he want to? Have you really counted the cost? Are you as good as dead so that Whatever happens to you, you are so resigned to his perfect will, you are all his. You know, he, a few years ago he said to me, I said to him, you are my everything. And he said to me, I'm only your everything when I'm all you have. The price that he asks of us is ultimate. But so is the glory. So is the glory. So is the intimacy. So is the friendship. So is the way he is over us. When he sees that we give him all. That when he sees we long to give him all. You know, the word says his eyes row to and fro in seeking those whose heart is perfect towards him. Not they themselves. Nobody's perfect. But their heart is perfect. In other words, they long to not withhold anything from him and are willing. So this it's a process. Their heart is perfect towards him. They are authentic. They are the real thing. They search their hearts. They ask the relevant questions. Is this true about me? And when they find out it's not true, they seek him earnestly, 
because they desire to give him all. Not in fear, but in love. When you're in love, you'll give anything to that person. No one has greater love than he who lays down his life for his friends. I call you my friends, he says in John 15. Friend is a covenant term where you can truly say, once you've entered into it, I am his and he is mine. So in Psalm 25, in verse 14, we read, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. That word secret is Strong's H5475, and it means counsel. It means secret counsel. It means familiar converse, intimacy with God, of a circle of family, familiar friends. So he's, when he says the secret of the Lord, it means that intimacy that close union I have with those who fear me and has given their lives over to me completely. Not said a prayer yonks ago, but are actually living a life that is given over completely to him. My secret counsel is with them. I divulge, I, I share my heart with them. They know me. They are in my inner circle. They are my close friends. They are my Benjamins, the Joseph's Benjamins. They are the Elijahs, they are the John the Baptist, the friend of the bridegroom. Okay, And the word show means, is H3045 and it means to make myself known or reveal oneself. He says, I will reveal myself to you. And then the covenant is H1285, he says he will reveal the covenant, means an alliance of friendship and an alliance of marriage. So the other day I woke up at 5.22 and this is what it means. It means I take away, remove, pass. I am taken away, withdrawn. He wants to take his bride away. And it's from age 142 and it means to raise, take up, lift. I raise, lift up, take away and remove. So he's clearly speaking about how he is soon coming to take his dove. He will take her away. Psalm 68, verse 13. Though you have lion among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove, covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. So lying amongst the pots, you know, remember that Christ was crucified outside of the camp. Okay? And... Outside of the camp is a reference to the potter's field. Now the potter's field is where all the broken pots um, that the potters didn't want, they all threw them away. And we are all broken pots that he, outside of the camp that he has prepared and used. He uses broken vessels and he pours out his gold amongst the cracks so that his glory can shine through it. Right? And he says, though you have lying among the pots... Though you have become so dark like the Shulamite, where she says, Do not look upon me, for I am black. She's referring to being aware of her sin, that she is part of these broken pots, that is clay, that is dust. She's aware of her insignificance. And he says, Even though you are as black as that, even though you have lain among the pots, your wings of the dove will be covered with silver and her feathers will be of yellow gold. So I went to the biblestudy.org website and a commentary on this. And I'm just going to read it because it's so beautifully speaking about the bride. The philosopher observes that the necks of doves appears of a golden color by the refraction of light. And this describes the saints and people of God as they are by grace. They are comparable to the dove on many accounts, like doves of the valleys Every one of them mourn for their iniquities. Like the trembling and fearful dove tremble at the apprehensions of divine wrath and judgment to come under first convictions and are fearful of their enemies and of their own state, are humble, modest and meek, 
think the worst of themselves and the best of others. Flee to Christ for refuge and to ordinances for refreshment. Are chaste and affectionate to Christ and harmless and inoffensive in their lives and conversations. Being as the wings of a dove covered with silver may denote the purity of doctrine held by them. The words of the Lord being as silver purified seven times and the preciousness and sincerity of their faith by which they mount up with wings as eagles and the holiness of their conversation being as becomes the gospel of Christ and being as the feathers of a dove covered with yellow gold may denote their being adorned with the graces of the spirit as faith hope and love which are more precious than gold that perisheth and are called chains of gold see all their being clothed with the righteousness of christ signified by gold of ophir this is a reference to psalm 45 where the bride is adorned with the gold of ophir which is the queen of the south okay and clothing of wrought gold or their being enriched with the unsearchable solid substantial and durable riches of christ it describes the church in the latter day when her light will be will become and the glory of the lord will rise upon her when her stones will be laid with their fair colors and her foundations with sapphires when she shall have the glory of god upon her and be as a bride adorned for her husband so here you have a description of the Queen of the South, which is the dove, the morning dove, that will take flight. Now, that when he tells her, rise up, my beloved, in Song of Solomon 2, it means to take flight. So he was, without a doubt, referring to Song of Solomon 2 when he spoke to me and gave me those words. We find here that her foundations are with sapphires. Not long ago, I had a, a dream where a dove was sitting on my shoulder and it was the most beautiful dove. And the only way I can describe it is how it was just described now in this uh, commentary now. It has the most beautiful sapphire, uh, emerald green, deep pink colors in it and it was sitting on my shoulder and it loved me it was all in my neck and it just wanted to be held and it was so lovable and I wanted to go downstairs to my husband to tell him about it and my husband in a fit of rage threw something out the door before I got to the door and I knew I couldn't share something that can be frightened so easily that's so innocent and so pure I couldn't share it with him so I turned around and when I turned around there were dogs all around me and um, and when I got to the top of the stairs I saw the feathers of this dove on the floor covered in blood and the interpretation of that vision was the, that of the Holy Spirit the government of the Spirit being through love resting on my shoulder right and going down speaks of going down in humility down the stairs. And my husband represented the backslidden church that is angry and protecting the Holy Spirit and only finding the blood on the feathers, meaning that when, when we will be persecuted, it is the Spirit in us of Christ being persecuted. And the dogs represent friends of man or man's best friend, and that the Lord said that he will bring those friends along my path. So you see how the bride and the dove, is, uh, which is also the spirit, are all the same thing. Okay. Let me read a message or a, a word that Father gave me on the 15th of July, 2021. That is a few years ago. But let me read it and it's applicable to what I just spoke to you about now. My precious doves, you who have a single eye focused on me, not only in your lives, but a heart wholly given over. I will send you out in flight to all the nations, that the token of true peace in the midst of chaos may be seen by all. 
As I descended on my son when he rose from the waters of baptism, so I will descend on you, you who have risen in my might from the waters of the baptism of death into new life. Just as your life has been sustained by my spirit all along, so I will sustain you. I will shine upon you and you will declare my glory amongst the nations so that all will call upon me in a time of need. For only in me will they find true peace in a time of war and calamity. Arise, my doves, and come away with me. Arise and shine with my glory that will come upon you. You have given me your all. Now I give you all things in this time of great need, that you may be a comfort to my people just as I have comforted you, that you may speak tenderly to them as I did to you, that you may rise with healing in your wings as I rose over you. So come, my doves, let us fly over the nations. Let us bring hope faith and love amidst the darkest hour. I will bear you up with my wings, my doves. I will be the wind beneath your wings. I will cause you to soar above the storms that the eyes of the blind may see and the deaf may hear and call upon me. The window of opportunity, only a small opening, but those who desires to be free, to know my ways, will hearken. So come and fly away with me. A message of hope in a dark world where there will seem as if there is no hope at all is what you will be. A message of hope. Amen. The other day, um, Father brought me to read um, uh, two chronicles, can't remember which chapter, 23, I think, um, about Solomon building the temple. I just happened to open the Bible there and I started reading it. And the Spirit came over me and um, as I read it, Father started speaking to me um, and gave me that word, the latter will be greater, or the greater will, the latter will be greater that word of the glory that will be coming because of the fact that the greater than Solomon will be here. Now we are all workers, the, the bride. Uh, well, we're not all workers. What I want to say is the workers are all builders. Okay, We are all builders. We are building within the church, just like the ark. You know, the ark is representing the bride, that brings in the animals, the flock, that brings them into the ark of safety. She is bringing them in. And the ark was made of cedar wood. Made of different woods, but cedar wood as well. It's made of cedar wood. Um, it's, it's the gopher wood that is spoken about. And when Solomon made the temple, he made the pillars of cedar wood because of their durability, because of their length, um, because they could sustain harsh weather. So these pillars that he made represents endurance, stability, strength, and of course being on the right hand. Okay, so uh, a while back, Father started speaking to me um, about the forum that I was involved in and um, he guided me through a dream that he gave me that I would be moving office, so to speak. And in this dream, I, um, I was packing up everything that I had in my prayer room like I have here, um, all my art material and everything. I've got it under my arm and we are staying on a farm there and I'm going to move now all my, literally moving my office to the abandoned house that were on the grounds. And when I walked in, it's just dust everywhere. It's unkept, but there's nothing in there. And I found two women standing um, at the scullery part and they're washing dishes. And somebody's with me. I believe it was the Holy Spirit. And I went and looked for a room where I could put all my stuff in. Okay, so that was the dream. And basically, 
what that meant was that um, he was taking me away from where I've been ministering to people and he's taking me to a new place. And at that point, I had no idea what that new place was. I just had to be obedient to what he was showing me. It wasn't an easy thing for me to do because I was almost five years involved with people there and loved them very, very, very much. So, um, so to not be involved, actively involved, was a death that I had to enter into. And it was also a prophetic act of him showing, understand that you will go from place to place. Just like Yeshua told his disciples, I will, you will go from house to house representing church to church okay so the other day i was thinking lord you told me that you are moving me to another place but you haven't shown me what that is yet and as i was going about my day suddenly he reminded me of john 21 where he spoke to peter which was the exact scripture that he gave me to tell me that i need to go um, and that scripture is where Peter came from the ship and sat on the beach and Yeshua was uh, uh, making them breakfast and he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? And those, When I read those words, I knew he was saying to me, do you love me more than those you've been ministering to? And obviously my answer was yes, but I knew where he was going with it. And then he said to me, then he says to Peter, and remember my name is Petra, so it comes from Peter. Um, and so what I'm saying is saying it to the church as well. Do you love me more than these? Are you willing to forsake all? And then he said to Peter, feed my lambs. Then he said to him, feed my sheep. And then the third time he said again, feed my sheep. Okay. So these have specific meanings to it when he said that. The lambs, they are a reference to the first fruits. The lambs represent the bride, or the worker bride. It represents innocence. It represents being unblemished. And the place where I was ministering at that time, were those type of workers. They are the workers. And I've been ministering to them for so long. And so he wasn't saying to me at that moment, Peter, feed my lambs. He wanted, he showed me in this time now, where I'm sending you to now is my sheep. You have been feeding the lambs, but I'm now going to send you to the sheep. Now remember, he tells the disciples in Luke 11, no, in Luke 10, he tells them, I am sending you as lambs amongst the wolves. So the disciples, those workers being sent out, they are the lambs, they are the first fruits. And they are being sent to the different churches, to the different houses, to where the sheep are, those that were lost. Okay, he's sending them out. And that is what he wanted to tell me. And this is part of the eminence, eminency message that he's bringing across. He's saying, I'm sending you out to the sheep. I'm sending you out to minister to the churches. The time is here where my dove will be taken. And once she's taken, my glory will be upon her and I will send her out to the churches. Okay. So, um, with this dream that I had about me moving office and these two ladies in the scullery, just yesterday um, I had a quick vision where I saw a dove coming into my scullery and sitting on my dishwasher. And that was it. And immediately the Holy Spirit reminded me of this dream of these two ladies in this abandoned house that was so dusty. Okay. And um, what he wanted to say to me then, that two ladies were there, represent those that will be sent out two by two. They are servants. Now, that's the difference between when you see in a dream something in a kitchen, 
cleaning versus something somebody in a in a bathroom the one is sanctification the other one is servanthood okay so he's referring he is once again yesterday showing me that the dove will rest upon those servants that will be cleaning the house the house of god they will go in and get rid of the foxes in the house and tend to the the, the figs and the vines a reference to the children, their children in the house. Remember, the pillars means foster parents and mothers. Um, lately, um, in this week, so many people have been speaking to me about occupying, about... Uh, uh, um, cleaning house about uh, uh, either a dream or something physically happening um, I've had uh, 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 my friend Maya that has had two dreams of a house being dusty a hospital represents the church my dream of the church being dusty um, I remember Sister Donna had a dream as well of the dust that filled the church and the Bible. So the church is asleep at the moment, the dust that's there. And he's sending in his servants to clean, to get rid of the things that needs to be cleaned. right? To speak in judgment and authority over them and to get the church in order to wake up because of the judgment that will be coming. Okay, so we are spiritual mothers and fathers sent to the churches. So let's read Luke 11. And we're going to start from verse 24. And this is the account of the parable or the uh, uh, teaching that Yeshua was speaking to the Pharisees about, uh, uh, about the, the house being cleaned. Okay, and we are going to... Just dissect this a bit and talk about this as well. Luke 11 verse 24. And Yeshua says to them the following. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeketh rest. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. So the unclean spirit is taken out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. So remember, we're now talking about the church here, right? And dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bear thee, and the paps which thou suck. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So he is talking about a house where the evil spirit is chased out. The evil spirit wants to come in and he finds it furnished and swept and garnished. It's clean, right? But there's nobody in there. And he comes in and he brings seven times, seven evil spirit worse. So it's seven times worse the state of that house because nobody's there. Okay. And then he ends it off by saying, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So, occupying that house is to hear the word of God and keep it. That's how you occupy your house is by hearing and keeping, obeying those who live in obedience. In other words, those who are authentic and do what the word of God says, not some of it, but all of it. Okay. So in Luke 11, verse 21, just before what we've just read, he says, When a strong man, armed, keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Okay, so here he talks about a strong man that is in the house. Nothing can come into the house because he keeps his palace. How does he keep his palace? By hearing and keeping the word of God. He keeps his palace. He's walking in obedience. Okay. And his goods, nothing can be stolen. And then after this specific verse, he starts talking about how the evil spirits are chased out and they come back because they find it unoccupied. 
So this strong man in the Strongs means strong, mighty, of living beings, strong either in body or in mind, of one who has strength of soul to sustain the attacks of Satan, strong and therefore exhibiting many excellences, of inanimate things, strong, violent, forcibly uttered, firm and sure. So this strong man talks about that pillar. It talks about that that Christian, that bride, that is able to come against the enemy because she walks and lives in obedience to the word and she keeps it. She has grown and has become strong. She herself is a strong man, so to speak. Okay, she is strong in mind and in spirit. The word keepeth, she keeps her palace. To observe for oneself something to escape, to avoid, shun and flee from. To guard for oneself, for safety's sake, so as not to violate, to keep and observe the precepts of the law. Once again, referring to hearing the word and keeping it. And by that growth, becoming a strong man that protect your palace, your house. So the church as a whole is one body, but the body has many members. In this case, many houses. We, your temple, your body is a temple. Okay. Luke 21 tells us, verse 34, And take heed to yourselves. Lest any at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that the day come upon you unawares. What day? The day that he will come. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So if it's a snare, what are you waiting for? Well, what are you watching for if it's a snare, if you don't know when it's coming? Well, the bride will know. There will be such an urgency in a spirit. There will be such a knowing that it's any time. So she will, she will actively watch and wait. It will not be, oh, just another date go past. Or there will be a longing like the cry of the spirit in her will cry out and mourn. She will be a mourning dove. Okay. Verse 36. Watch ye therefore. And pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things, all these things, escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. To be accounted worthy means that you will be deemed worthy. How will you be de deemed worthy? You kept your palace as a strong man. Account means to tally up, counting the cost. Those who have not only counted the cost, but paid the cost of following him. Psalm 45 says that she left mother and father. The queen of Sheba, which is the queen of the south, left everything to come to, this, to Solomon, to learn wisdom of him. Okay. Luke 11 verse 22. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusteth, and divideth his spoil. Okay, so let's go to verse, let me just see where that verse is. 23. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. So this word scattereth. So Yeshua was talking here about if somebody stronger than you come and, and spoils your house because you have not kept the word, then everything of you is taken. They steal from you, right? And then he says, but that is the reason why you're being spoiled is because you are not for me. You think you are for me, but you're actually not for me. Because you are divided. You are not completely mine. You are still kept from your life back. Okay. This word scattereth is G4650. And it's the word scorpizo. 
and it means apparently from the same as G4651 and it means to dissipate, put to flight, waste, be liberal, disperse abroad and scatter. So it says you're not gathering in. You're not part of those that bring in souls. You are not occupying until I come. You're in your house doing your Christian thing. You think you are right with me, but you are not a strong man. And the enemy is going to come and he's going to spoil your house. He's going to take from you because you are not strong enough to endure him. And because you are not strong and because you have not given me, your heart is not perfect towards me, you are actually scattering. Okay? And that scorpizo means scorpion. Okay? So we talk about the scorpions within the church that will come against the prophets of God, those that will be sent out. So let's consider the fact that he's talking here about the, the bride that protects her house as a strong man. But let's consider also the fact that Yeshua, as I read in Song of Solomon 2, 14, that he is a heart, okay, and a heart means a strong man and a pillar as well. So let's read that in context as well, that when he is here and he leaves, what will happen? Now in, in uh, Psalm 19, it says the following. In verse 1, we start verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto a day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So it's talking about the stars and everything. Verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Verse 5, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. He's going forth is from the end of the heaven, and he's circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Heat thereof. So here we find the strong man as a bridegroom. Okay? And he's saying, once the strong man, let's verse 22, but when a stronger man than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusteth and divideth his spoil. Okay, So that talks about the enemy being stronger than you. But when he says that the strong man protects his palace, that is referring to Yeshua. Being the strong man of our palace, of our heart. He protects us as well. Okay? And there's a reference here to the sun coming out. Just like Song of Solomon, when the day breaks. Where she calls him, when the day breaks. When the, when the sun comes and, and enters into darkness and the darkness cannot overwhelm it. Once again, referencing John 1, where the light comes in, where, where John the Baptist points to the light, not being the light, but as a light, pointing to the light. He is the bridegroom, all a reference to the imminency of his return. So this, where he says, uh, verse 23, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. That word gathereth means to fish, bring into a house. So he's saying, there's no middle ground here. You're either gathering in or you're scattering. That scattering uh, uh, means to disperse, right? So a house is found empty and unoccupied. That means... Not only are you not doing what is expected of you in obedience, but you're also not bringing in souls. You're not ministering to people. You're not busy as a servant. Okay? And Yeshua told us to occupy till he comes. Okay. Now, in Luke 19... Yeshua gives a parable. It's right at the end. And he's talking to the servants. That will be the workers. Okay, And he tells them, uh, he gives them a parable of the king that uh, 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 
we had uh, servants and he gave them each 10 pounds. And 10, the number 10 means completeness. So in other words, I've given you more than enough to do what you need to do. And each one of them had different um, excuses. Uh, or one had an excuse why he didn't make any money uh, or uh, increase on the 10 pounds. And the others uh, did as well. And as they uh, uh, increased in what they did during this time of the great harvest, they were given cities. The one who increased his 10 pounds had 10 cities. The other one who had 5 pounds increased uh, had 5 cities and received that. And remember, the workers will inherit with him the kingdom and they will rule and reign at the millennial reign. This is their reward, apart from him being their reward. Okay, so... In Luke 19 verse 10, he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Now, in order to say something is lost, you obviously first have to have it. So this speaks of the sheep, not the lambs, the sheep that needs to be fed, those that are lost, those that are wandered off, those that have not kept their palace, have not kept their house, have been uh, 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 compromising. I've been doing their own thing. I've been saying they are or ascribing to something, but not being the real thing. Not truly being in love. Utterly and desperately in love. Not forsaking all, but still keeping in part. Okay. So I had a few years ago, I had um, a vision, two visions, and I just want to read it with the interpretation, because it holds hands with this dove, Right, And we read that the foundation of the dove of this Jerusalem will be sapphires. Okay, so we spoke about these sapphires. I got these two visions in this, uh, on the 2nd of May 2021. The first vision was during my morning prayer. I saw a little boy of approximately 8 years old sitting on the ground looking very dirty. He had black curly hair and he was a beautiful child. He looked poor and was lifting the edge of what looked to me like a square piece of sackcloth from the ground as to carefully peek underneath it. And what he found was absolutely beautiful. It was a very huge blue sapphire. I would say about the size of a football. It was buried under the ground. That was the end of that vision. Then I had another vision later in the afternoon, that of the front page of the Times magazine. I knew that it was the Times magazine because of the yellow outline. On this page was a picture of a little blonde girl with ponytails. She was looking ahead of her, very innocent and cute, but I think there was something different about her. The cute factor was not there, but a seriousness, I would say. In big, bold yellow letters, the heading read, We are here. And then that morning on my YouTube feed, one of these random videos came up of rescuers that rescued a girl of the same age, also with two ponytails, from out of a well. So the interpretation is as follows. The poor boy and the two girls resemble the sons and daughters of God. This disposition of the children of God is that they are poor and spirit and innocent. Remember the previous devotional, counting the cost, becoming as dust. They are in the dust and the sackcloth speaks of mourning and a humble attitude of heart as well as the fact that the boy was sitting on the ground. The treasure that he found was veiled or hidden under the sackcloth. The Time magazine is an indication of timing and that we are here, heading is saying, the time is now for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. Now this vision, Father, kept on, um, the Spirit kept on prompting me to go back to read it again and now I understand why he wanted me to. So we read about this in Romans 8, about the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. That it says that the whole of creation is waiting for this manifestation. That means heaven and earth is waiting for this manifestation. Not just that uh, uh, the, the escape or the rapture will take place, but that the glory of God will be made manifest in his sons and daughters. Okay, What is this treasure? It's the blue sapphire, right? He found this treasure under this sackcloth, this little boy in the dust. 
It is found in the ground, not on the ground. And this speaks of the foundation being sapphire, just like the dove with the fair colors. And Isaiah 54 says that the foundation of the new Jerusalem of Zion is laid with sapphires, pointing to the church being the foundation. And the workers in the seals period is finishing the foundation laid by the elders we read about in Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12. Okay, so we now understand that this foundation has got to do with sapphire. Okay, so let's go to about the state of the church. Now remember I spoke about the church is unoccupied. She's dusty because she's not, you know, not because of humbleness, but because she's not doing what she's supposed to be doing. Um, she's broken down. She's a broken down hospital. The sheep are lost. This is what we're being sent to. Okay. And we find the, uh, a, a reference to that in Acts 5 when we read about Ananias and Sapphira. Okay. And what happened with Ananias and Sapphira? They came to Peter. And at that time, the word says they had all things in common. That means everything belonged to one another. They shared food, housing, clothes, whatever. Okay? They shared because everybody was in need. They were being persecuted. And because they shared, nobody had any need or want. But here was Ananias and Sapphira, and they sold a land. And they decided amongst themselves in agreement that they are only going to give in part. And when they came to Peter, the Holy Spirit revealed to them to Peter that they have in fact lied. They have given they have said they have given the impression that they are giving in full when in fact they only gave in part. They the Holy the, Peter said you lied to the Spirit. Okay? So what this tells us now is that the church in this state of poverty of being broken down the lost sheep are those who, in contrast to the bride, have not given all. They have lied not only to the spirit, but have lied to themselves. They, they, they convince themselves that they are ready. They convince themselves they are part of the true bride. They convince themselves that, that uh, um, he will, of course, come and get them. And what happened is that judgment came over them because they lied to the Spirit. They were not being truthful when the Holy Spirit convicted them. Now Ananias means, uh, means Jehovah has graciously given, right? And Sapphira means Sapphire. So she represents the church, okay? That, that only gives in part whom the bride, the workers are being sent to. And I realized that my Telegram account were at only 77 uh, subscribers and I kept on getting the number 77 and I looked it up and it means without cost. Now that is no coincidence that my last devotional teaching was called Counting the Cost. And so what this church represents are those who have not counted the cost and were not willing to pay the cost, which is everything, absolutely everything. They were not willing and they lied to themselves and told themselves, I did. I really love him with all my heart. But they don't because they still keep back. They still hold back. They have not forsaken all to be his disciples. Okay, and then I saw my YouTube subscribers, subscribers is 392, and that means lie or deception. So they lied to the Holy Spirit. You see how Father guides me through all these numbers. Okay, so I spoke about the uh, uh, man in, in, in my previous devotional, Counting the Cost, when, we, when he brings us to dust. And I mentioned that in Ecclesiastes 3, how um, he said that, that he prays that man would know that without God, that they are as beasts 
and that just like the beasts die, we also die, and we have no preeminence over them, but that we also return to dust. And so, this what what happened in this week? I was listening to somebody sing. It was a group singing, and it was absolutely amazing. I was brought to tears listening to this beautiful voices, and. As I switched it off, the spirit came over me and I started to sob. I cried and I cried and I cried. And I realized what I was crying about was I was looking at man. Now, this is in complete uh, contrast to counting the cost where it's about being coming like dust and be uh, being as beasts without God. Now... What the Spirit was showing me and talking to me about was the cost that was that He paid, that the Father paid when He lost Adam to a lie. Because what He made there out of all of creation, He said, it is very good. My glory in this dust is very good and when the serpent came and lied he stole from God he stole his son he broke that communication he took away the glory and he stole from God because of a lie and this is why God hates lies When we lie to the Spirit, when we lie to ourselves, because many sons and daughters have been stolen from our Father. And this is what the bride and the workers will be doing. They will be going to get his sons and daughters. They will be ruthless with the enemy and his lies and deception. And so when I saw these men singing so beautifully, I was thinking how all of us were created for him. Every single person on this earth was created. So when you see somebody that is in Satanism, or is a homosexual, or a transvestite, or whatever it may be, when you see them suffering, when you see them in their, whether they're perverse or whatever the case may be, You're seeing a son and daughter that was stolen from God. You see them stolen and broken. And how he longs to bring them back. And this is what the enemy has stolen. What he originally intended and where Adam cried. uh, um, No, when, when God in the beginning cried in the garden and said, Adam, where are you? Where are you? We find Christ on the cross saying, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where are you? So entering into the dust and humanity and into this life in order to bring many sons and daughters back to him. This is why the heavens creation is waiting for the manifesting of the sons and daughters of God. Because it's not just the glory and the wonders of everything that will happen in tribulation during the the great revival that will take place only for so long. But it's the return of that which he originally intended. The return of the prodigals. We will run to them and kiss them fervently where they ate with with pods of the pigs, and will give them a new ring, new shoes, a new garment, and a banquet. And we as the elder brothers will have to rejoice and be rejoicing instead of being that elder brother and being a Pharisee. This is the heart of the Father. To go to the house, the dusty house of the churches, and bring his children back.
There's no middle ground. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. So the bride, as a description of the bride, she can honestly say, my beloved is mine and I am his. I am in covenant with him that everything that I have, everything that I am, all of me is his and all of his is mine. She has paid the price by leaving everything. She is utterly in love with him. She longs and mourns for his return. You have to ask yourself, am I doing that? Am I really longing for his return? She's watching and praying. She lives in truth and authenticity. She worships him in spirit and in truth because she and the spirit is one. You know, our sanctification process. I remember when um, he started the sanctification process in my life. My aim, my purpose for sanctification was to be one with him. That was my sole desire. It wasn't so that I will be accounted worthy to be a worker or work for him. The being a worker, being a servant was the outflow of my union with him. Because it's not what I can do for him, but it is what he can do through me. The, John 17, where Yeshua prayed the high priestly prayer, he was praying that they were, may be one as we are one. That means that covenantal oneness where the soul is tied with the other is in union with each other so that when it's when the spirit cries out of me it's because i and the spirit am one this is what he was referring to and whatever is in your house still not one with him still divided you still have rooms in your house that you have not allowed him to come in and deal with whether it's emotional healing or bitterness or whatever or things that you still hold on to that means that part is still not one with him and he desires to be a strong man in your house and to occupy and to occupy through you so that together with the spirit you are one voice. You see the same thing, hear the same thing, speak the same thing because there's union. You have been baptized. The bride has been baptized not just in water but in his death, a real felt death. She has entered into the baptism of death because that is what the Jordan represents. Okay. She's also not hesitant. She's not wondering whether he's coming to fetch her. She's not unsure of whether he's coming to fetch her. What bride, knowing that her bridegroom is coming, is standing at the window thinking, I sure hope he's coming. I hope, I hope he thinks I'm okay. I, I hope he's not going to reject me. No. That bride has come from a place of unsurety to knowing, expecting he's coming to get her. That's not prideful. That's union. That's knowing how much he loves her. When you know how much somebody loves you, you trust them. Not only do you prepare yourself, but you are expecting them. There's no unsurety. She is watching and waiting, not out of fear, but out of knowing. There's a big difference. She is ready. And so when you are at that, this place where you think, well, Petra, I, I don't know if I will be ready because I know I've still got issues to deal with. Remember, he is, his eyes are roaming to and fro in search of those whose hearts are perfect towards him. In other words, their whole being wants him, cries out for him and is willing to pay the price. And whatever he shows them to do, he, they do it. They are in preparation the whole time. They are occupying. They are hearing his words and keeping it. And so even though it's a process, because their heart is perfect towards him, they are ready.
by watching and waiting. So the question is, are you ready? Is your heart perfect towards the one who is making it clear that very soon he's coming to get his dove? Are you as this dove? Are you mourning for his return? Because you want to see his face. Not because you want to leave earth. Because you want to be with him. Because you're so in love with him. Your every moment is about him. Are you in love with him? Father, I thank you for this message. I pray that you will deeply, deeply work into the hearts of every person listening to it. We can become so busy with your work that we neglect you. And then we constitute that as being the whole, when we only give in part. Just because we're busy with your works doesn't mean that we're still in love with you. Help us to make that distinction. Help us to be willing to pay the price. Help us to occupy. Help us to cry out and mourn for your return. Because we can't wait to see you. Pray this in the name of Yeshua.